What is a dog? I would say a dog is a wolf that has evolved to be able to use humans in a new way. And it can do things that other species can't do as a result. If you were an alien looking at the earth and wondering which was the smart species, it's clear the dog is the smart one. Uh, because they adopted the most powerful tool on the planet, which is the human. So, the smartest animal on the planet, probably humans, but second, definitely dogs. When you think about the relationship between humans and dogs, there is no other relationship like that anywhere else in the animal kingdom. N nothing like it. Nothing resembles it. We're clearly doing good things for the dogs, so they're making a living off us. But what we get from them in return is a kind of social resource. It's not calories, it's not necessarily even performing some useful practical role like pulling sleds or chasing sheep. Dogs do it, all these things. But I think all of that is secondary to this social relationship. There's a theory of a kind of co-evolution of humans and dogs. By affiliating ourselves with an animal, yeah, it's a very nice we did probably increase our chances of survival. That's a theory. In contemporary times, I don't know if it confers us an advantage genetically to be affiliated with dogs, but it improves our lives. From very early childhood to the end of one's life, being with a dog biologically improves us. I think we tend to underestimate the degree to which this relationship that we've had with dogs has not just altered them and created a huge scope of radical shapes and sizes and behaviors and things that they can do, but also affected us and, and our view of the natural world. Humans owe dogs everything. I mean, really everything. All of civilization, cities, money. <laughs> you, if, if there's something that is important to you, thank a dog. We want to know the beginnings of things. That helps us to order the rest of the world. It helps us to understand where we've come from, allows us to place ourselves within the universe. The fundamental questions about where and when dogs originated are very controversial. One thing we do know, dogs are very clearly the first domestic animal. And dogs are the first by several thousand years. And we know that dogs were domesticated from ancient gray wolves and not from any number of other possible canid species. Beyond that, everything else is just a maybe. Dogs and wolves are incredibly close genetically. They're incredibly close morphologically, which means if you look at their skeletons, they look very similar. You can look at a wolf and you can look at a dog, especially a dog like a husky, and you say, well, you know, they're kind of similar. But stand near a wolf and stand near a husky, and it's a world of difference. The wolf has very little response to being petted. The wolf is not looking at you, it's not looking in your eyes, it's staring off into the wild. It's basically barely tolerating you being there. <laughs> How dogs eventually became domesticated is a really fascinating question. Domestication doesn't happen in one generation. Dog domestication likely happened over centuries, potentially even over thousands of years. And the timing is important because if it was as early as 30,000 years ago, this is when our ancestors were still hunter-gatherers. We were traveling in small groups, maybe a couple dozen people, wandering across vast plains. And the idea that's really gaining favor now is what's called the self-domestication hypothesis. 
wolves were already living in complicated social groups with brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and aunts and uncles and so on. And humans, at least at the time we're talking about, were quite similar in that respect. So I think there was a kind of a, an element of pre-adaptation so that if we had here an animal that was already pre-adapted to live in a, a complicated social group. Humans were moving from campsite to campsite with thrown away bones and maybe still had a little bit of meat on them. And the idea is that maybe wolves were lingering at the edges of our campsite. And only those wolves that were the least scared of people could get close enough to that food to eat it. And those wolves, they all of a sudden had an advantage over all the other skittish wolves out there. It's these two species who could view each other as predators, but instead potentially start to view each other as allies. You don't have to have a genome that says, look at this other species as an ally. It just has to say, don't flee from this potential predator. Just approach. It could be that the people who were more likely to take on those early dogs were themselves likelier to survive. It's entirely conceivable that there may have been a wolf population that rather than following caribou, say, started to follow us and took advantage of the products that we were leaving around on the landscape. By doing so, they would then start to protect us because we were then their resource base. Domestication is a dance. It's a dance between a wild animal and humans. And eventually, that leads to a point where the animals get used to the humans, the humans get more used to the animals, and you end up shifting the behavior and the shape and the color and the size of those animals. Within the community of people who study this relationship between humans and dogs, I think there's an understanding that what we have is something that is the result of co-evolution between two species. We have evolved for so long in partnership that it's possible to say that maybe there are some things that humans have done historically that they wouldn't have been able to do without dogs. that people hunted before they had dogs, but it's also rather clear that the style of hunting changed when they acquired dogs. People likely started to use dogs as trackers. That meant that you could, for example, shoot an animal with a poisoned arrow, and that animal then would run away. If it was just humans trying to track it, they might lose it because the animal would travel a great distance before it eventually died. But the dog can follow that animal unerringly because of its advanced sense of smell. So the dog extended our sensory powers as well as our practical abilities in an extraordinary way. Dogs allow people to survive in environments they wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to, or at least to be able to thrive in environments where otherwise humans would possibly struggle. And because we often use dogs kind of as tools to then get the most we possibly can out of a landscape, that means that you can see dogs almost as a, as a, a way that humans have been able to move around the earth maybe much more quickly and take advantage of resources they wouldn't otherwise be able to. We have radically altered the landscape of the entire planet as a result of these very close relationships that we've established with domestic animals. And we've effectively allowed for civilization and this massive boom in what now, seven billion people. Without domestication, you don't have none of that. And arguably without domestic dogs, you don't have anything to kick it off. So we better damn well know where those dogs came from. 
The purpose of this project is to understand when and where and how many times dogs were domesticated from ancient wolves. It could have been more than once, and it could have happened in many different places. So the only way to do this is to go big. And we have collected a lot of specimens from many, many different parts of the world. We have a large team, and we're making a big collaborative push to, to find answers. There are two different levels of biological organization. And the DNA tells us at the molecular level what differences there are in that individual relative to other individuals' genetic material. At the morphological level, that also informs us more about the life history of that individual, the size, the shape changes, and the anatomy that you can't really get access to by looking at the DNA. Then we're going to combine those two perspectives. This research really is only possible because of the revolutions in DNA sequencing technology over the last decade or so. In the dedicated ancient DNA facility that we've got, we have a very clean space in which we can extract and then get the DNA ready for sequencing. The project involves not just genetic information, but morphological information, and we're trying to get the same amount of data from all the same specimens. What we do is a relatively recent and evolving area called photogrammetry, and that allows us to use an ordinary camera and take a whole bunch of still photographs, put them all into a computer, and have the computer stitch together a render of a 3D image, and then we can see really subtle changes in shape and size from skull to skull, from population to population, in time and space. And that will allow us then to try and identify the population of wolves or populations of wolves that gave rise to domestic dogs and what happened from there. It's that satisfaction of not just having it be a complete guess and combining data in interesting and new ways to really try and get to the bottom of something that is really pretty fundamental to who we are as a species. There have been this striking changes in relationship with dogs and people over time. We start to see evidence like this 12,000-year-old find in northern Israel where you have a human not only buried with a dog, but the human's hand is resting on the dog's chest. Earlier dog burials, dogs tend to be in pieces. Sometimes there's evidence that dogs were eaten. So this find 12,000 years ago suggests potentially a more sentimental relationship. Romans were one of the first people that we know of that started breeding different breeds of dogs. Ancient Egypt, Sumerians, they understood that characteristics of the parent could be somehow transmitted to the offspring. Three to 4,000 years ago, you start to see the first signs of differentiation. So maybe mastiff type breeds first make their appearance around that time. You see greyhound type breeds making their appearance about that time, as well as little lapdog breeds, which were probably used just as pets. Even though dogs were revered in ancient Rome and even ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, when we get to the Middle Ages, the Black Death sweeps Europe. You start to see a very different relationship between humans and dogs. Dogs start to be blamed for spreading disease. They're viewed as filthy, dirty animals, carriers of death and disease. Dogs are killed by the thousands and dogs have a very poor reputation during this era, and that lasts for a long time. In the 1600s, there was a French philosopher named René Descartes who declared that all animals were soulless machines, that they didn't have any thoughts or feelings, they were basically just a collection of gears and springs. 
that actually turned out to be a very bad thing for dogs because his philosophy really caught on and it helped uh, early scientists, early doctors justify this practice of vivisection where they would operate on animals while they were still alive, no anesthetic. And that really justified centuries of researchers, early doctors operating on dogs. Dogs were a very popular animal for discovering how the body worked, how certain organs work. Charles Darwin talked about dogs a lot in Origin of Species. For him, uh, dogs were a fantastic example to show how selection can shape uh, the way an animal looks and behaves, sometimes over a relatively short period of time. People may not realize this, but Charles Darwin was a huge dog lover. He owned at least 13 dogs during his life. And actually, dogs are really entwined with some of his major scientific discoveries. When he came back from the Galapagos Islands, these were islands that really helped him formulate his theory of evolution. This first thought turned to one of his dogs. He had this bulldog who was very aggressive with everybody else, but really liked Darwin. And Darwin had been away for years. And he said, I wonder if this dog's gonna remember who I am. If he remembers who I am, he's not gonna bark at me. And sure enough, the dog totally remembered who Darwin was, came up to him, was very affectionate, and Darwin said, gosh, you know, these dogs, they, have, they must have these incredible memories. He started to think about dogs having something like language, because when we talked to them, they bark back to us. He even speculated that dogs were capable of empathy and abstract thought. This is all when he was formulating his big theory of evolution, he's thinking about dogs. So Darwin was very influential, not only in his caring about dogs, but actually he was really one of the first scientists to really think about what was going on in the dog's mind. One of the really significant developments in our relationship with dogs is the rise of a legal movement to protect them. Before the 1860s in the United States, there were very few laws that protected any animals. And even the laws that were on the books were not enforced. The American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was founded in the 1860s in the United States. The early focus tends to be on horses, but after the coming of the automobile and the turn of the 20th century, the chief focus is on dogs and cats. You know, the 1820s and 30s are a moment where um, the class structure of the United States is changing. And you begin to get a sort of self-conscious, self-aware middle class. And those folks are very tied to ideas about the possibility of improvement and perfectibility. Their ability to move up the social ladder is dependent on that. And one of the ideas is the importance of kindness to dependent others, and that could be enslaved people, the elderly, and animals as well. And dogs become the sort of poster child for all this. The AHA, which is the American Humane Association, actually formed in the aftermath of the ASPCA. It looked out for dogs that were being used in wars. It sponsored Be Kind to Animals Week where it would go into schools and teach children to be kind to animals. In the mid-1900s, a new concern emerges, and that concern is the rise of cats and dogs being used in medical research. In the post-World War II era in America, we see this boom in biomedical research, and dogs were, again, the animals of choice. Dogs were very important early on for testing things like heart valves and new drugs and new medications. There was such a huge demand for these animals that you start to see a person known as the buncher come along. And these were people that would literally go into people's yards and steal their pets. There were very famous cases. There's a case of a Dalmatian named Pepper in the 1960s that was literally stolen out of her family's yard. The family could not find the dog. We searched desperately for her for two weeks. They finally track her down to a medical school in New York where she had been the subject of a heart valve experiment. The experiment had gone awry and the dog had been killed.
then Life Magazine did an expose called Concentration Camps for Dogs with pictures of these dogs suffering in horrendous conditions. And the public got so upset about it, they actually flooded Congress with thousands of letters. This was how upset the public was, not just about these animals being used in research, but the horrific conditions that they were being kept in and the fact that they were being stolen. The Humane Society of the United States actually rose partially in response to that, to fight back against that. And especially when you had all these stories rising about pepper and concentration camps for dogs, the HSUS was able to use this information and really rally uh, public support and political support for what was called the Laboratory Animal Welfare Act. And this was the most comprehensive, sweeping animal welfare legislation that had ever been passed in the United States. One of the things when you're interested in the history of pet keeping is you start to collect weird stuff. This is, a, is um, flea tox, which is a flea powder from the 1930s. And I'll just read you one thing on the back of it. It says, for dogs, cats, birds, poultry, and humans. <laughs> so it could get rid of your fleas too. Flea soaps and flea powder were really a critical change. They made it possible both for you to keep the animal more comfortable and for you to bring animals into the house. In the 1900s specifically, when the world became a lot more industrialized, when we were living in smaller family units, where we used to live with grandparents and cousins, and all of a sudden it was just a nuclear family. There was this emotional void that was created in our homes. We started to see dogs come indoors. Flea control, modern flea control, has made it possible for people to share their beds with their dogs in a way that they wouldn't have before. This is really significant because when that animal starts living in your house, sleeping in your bed, playing with your children inside the house, then we begin to see these animals really as family members. Humans have um, certainly had an effect on the appearance of dogs, no question about it. There's a very, very important thing that people need to understand about the diversity of breeds we have today. How old is that diversity? It's 200 years old. It's from the Victorian era. At the end of the 18th century, people started breeding prize-winning livestock especially the aristocracy got into breeding giant cows and giant pigs. People would go to livestock shows and win prizes. Soon after that, the emerging middle classes thought they wanted to get in on this kind of competitive animal breeding activity. This was the evolution of the Victorian animal fancy. By the 1850s, there were dog fancies. Kennel clubs were founded. The stud books were established so that you could say your dog was a descendant of this particular famous male dog. In the early days, you know, the pedigree names that they give to dogs have this kind of quasi-aristocratic feel, so the dog will be called Stumpfhund von Engelsberger or something and other 
breeders can say, ah, oh, well, my dog is descended from old Stumpfund von Engelsberg. And uh, people will nod and go, oh, what a wonderful dog. You're starting with a small founder population and a relatively small diversity of genes in that founder population. And what happens if you keep recycling those genes, in other words, inbreeding, literally breeding into that population instead of outbreeding, bringing new genetic material. What tends to happen is that you reveal genetic mutations that are unhealthy or lethal in some cases. It's a form of eugenics. It's this harking back to the notion of aristocratic bloodlines and how the aristocracy should maintain their purity. Uh, and we know what it did to the aristocracy, so we should be aware of the dangers of doing it to dogs. Most of the dogs in the world are not purebred dogs or even pet dogs, but they're what we call village dogs. These semi-feral dogs that scrounge around uh, where, where humans live. And they are reliant on people, but they're not owned in the sense that people are provisioning them or providing them with medical care or controlling the breeding. So they're essentially natural populations living in human altered landscapes. There is sort of a classic look. Um, a lot of the village dogs are sort of flavors of the same <laughs> sort of type. And, and you see you know, tan dogs or cream dogs, or German Shepherd sort of colored dogs. You'll see floppy-eared street dogs and you'll see prick-eared street dogs. And these dogs I think are particularly interesting. They're not being selected to be a show dog. They're just being selected to survive basically and reproduce. And so it tells us a lot about how early dogs might have lived and maybe the sorts of environments that, that they lived in. We you know, rely on collaborators across the world. We'll find these dogs and we'll take cheek swabs or draw blood samples. We'll figure out how healthy these dogs are and try to get a better understanding of how these populations of dogs, which are pretty much all over uh, the world, certainly the developing world, um, how they're related to each other. So who do we have here today? That is... This is B. If somebody, let's say, comes to the animal hospital here with a dog that's an interesting breed, we ask the person if they'd like to take part in the research, and we draw a blood sample from that dog in the clinic. Good girl. And then um, we, we extract the DNA, we put it in the DNA bank, and it's available here for my research lab, for other researchers. Hey, Joy. We had a bull mastiff come in the clinic today, so I think you'll be able to get some DNA out of that. I love the idea that all of these dogs can tell us uh, something about people because we have different breeds of dogs that are predisposed to different genetic conditions, and they're all living in this environment that's pretty similar uh, to the environment that, that humans live in. Potentially, we can learn a lot about environmental triggers for disease. We can use the breed structure of the dogs to find uh, genetic variations that influence diseases that are likely also going to be important pathways in, in human disease. We're eating the same diet, we're living in the same environment, and we've been doing it for just as long as the dogs have. So there's going to be a lot of parallels there and stuff that we can learn about ourselves. In the 1970s, a researcher named Mark Beckoff at the University of Colorado started studying dog play behavior. And this may seem like a really frivolous thing. I mean, what can studying dogs play really teach us about what's going on in their heads? But play is this really interesting behavior because play can be actually very dangerous in the wild. There's a lot of animals that play. It's not just dogs and cats. In the wild, coyotes, other animals play. But when you play, you can hurt yourself, you can hurt somebody else by accident, you increase your chances of being preyed upon because if you're playing, you're distracted, another animal could come by and eat you, but animals still do it. And so why do they do it? Mark Beckoff had this idea that maybe they just do it because it's fun. And if they're doing something because it's fun, it suggests they had rich emotional lives. 
He's been studying play for decades. He takes tapes dogs playing, he plays back the tapes very slowly, and he sees all these really interesting signals. He sees things like dogs bowing before they play. They sort of crouch on their front paws and they lift their butt into the air. And this is sort of like, hey, do you want to play with me? Or, hey, I just knocked you over, I'm really sorry, it was just play. Dogs also do things like they self-handicap during play. So if they're really big dogs playing with a small dog, the big dog will roll over on her back so to give the other dog the advantage. Because if you're always overpowering your partner, play is not very fun. And by observing behaviors like this, he says, Mark Beckoff starts, and other researchers start saying, gosh, there's this really interesting emotional stuff that's happening during play. The dogs have these conceptions of, of empathy because they don't want to overpower the other dog, or fairness, or even morality. Then there was two groups of researchers, one led by Brian Hare, who's now at Duke University, one led by Anna McClosey, who's a Budapest researcher, and they both showed independently that dogs could follow what we mean when we point. So if we point at a cup that has a treat in it, dogs go to that cup and they'll uncover the treat. And that may seem like a really simple skill. In fact, even one-year-old children can do it. But it turns out wolves can't do it. Chimpanzees, which are more closely related to us than any other animal on the planet, don't necessarily understand what we mean when we point at something, and yet dogs do. The reason the pointing is so important is because when I point at something, it says that I'm trying to show you something. So dogs have to intuit that, hey, that person wants me to see something you're getting a little bit of a sense of what's going on in our heads. And that's a very complex skill. And so you start to see the, this explosion in dog cognition research. Today, there's nearly a dozen labs around the world that study the canine mind. Come on, Scuba. Okay, ready? Why? Yes. Do we do some warm-ups? Yeah, sure. Come on. I think that why science has gotten so excited about dogs is because they really are remarkable in terms of how they solve social problems relative to other species. When we compare dogs to wolves, dogs are solving problems in a way that's much more similar to how human infants solve problems than how even our own closest relatives, bonobos, chimpanzees, and their own closest relative, the wolf, would handle the same problem. That's really remarkable. Why would a species so distantly related to us be more similar to us in how they solve social problems than our own closest relatives. Okay. Good. Oh, good boy. And it's even more interesting than that because what they're doing is they're using um, human gestures, they're using uh, eye contact, they're responding to all sorts of social information we're giving them. Okay. When they get stuck in a problem, they refer to us for potential solutions. Choice of boy. One of the things that we've used to try to understand, you know, how sensitive is a dog to a person is to sort of look at the amount of eye contact they make uh, when they're interacting. Because one of the things that a dog like Polly does is uh, he'll look at you in the eyes. And of course, as a human, that captures your attention immediately. And we've learned that when dogs make eye contact with us and the amount of time they make eye contact, that's actually related to, to what humans then report about the, the quality of the relationship they have with their dog. A dog that makes a lot of eye contact with their owner is a dog that their owners then report they have a very strong bond with. Now, it's really interesting because we also think we might know the mechanism that's behind that. Because when we make eye, eye contact with each other or with your dog, it actually releases a hormone called oxytocin, which is involved in social bonding. So in a sense, your dog, when it's making eye contact with you, is hugging you with its eyes. And it's not necessarily trying to ask you for anything. Um, and you know, the implication is probably they're experiencing something very similar to what we're experiencing. So we can just quickly show you, uh, you know, uh, Sophie's gonna play uh, with this ball and we're gonna let uh, uh, Polly watch and then we're gonna stop playing and just see where does he look.
So that's a lot of eye contact. Uh, you know, he immediately looks up as if to say, hey, what are you going to do next? Um, and then he's looking between the ball and Sophie. These are all things that are core to a revolution that occurs in young infants at about 9 to 12 months, where infants start doing the exact same thing, and developmental psychologists who study how humans become humans during their lives, that is the moment that they think is crucial to becoming cultural and linguistic. And it is those same abilities they think that culture and ling language are built on. And dogs are doing some of the same things. And so, of course, that's going to get people's attention because, my goodness, they're so distantly related to us. How could it be that a species that's so not like us is so like us in a way that's so important to making us the species that we are? I think there are good societal reasons to try to understand the dog's point of view. What are their capacities? What is their experience like? Knowing more about them is critical to starting to understand how to answer those questions. Our eyesight's not as good as ours for most things, but they are very sensitive to movement, probably more so than we are. I'm thinking about what my dog is thinking from moment to moment. His thoughts are moving rapidly from things like, what's that noise outside the house? Is there a squirrel in the backyard? Is that clanking in the kitchen mean food? You know, he's, he's, he's moving incredibly fast. I mean, his thought processes are extremely rapid, and that's why he jumps to conclusions far quicker than I can on the basis of evidence. His powers of perception are extraordinary. The slightest thing can trigger a, an instantaneous response, whereas I would have to sort of think about it much more extensively. Dogs don't have this super hearing that people seem to think that dogs do, but they do have a higher, a big, broader range of hearing, so they can hear high frequency sounds, which we don't hear. We call it ultrasonic. That's because we don't hear it, it's ridiculous. They just have a slightly different spectrum than we do. That high frequency hearing does mean that they're probably experiencing things in an ambient environment which we're not sensitive to. That could include things like the whir of insects who also send out signals in that high frequency range to each other or the, the, buzz, the sound of a fluorescent bulb or something like that, that m most people are not experiencing all the time. When we look at a dog and we see that they're seeing us or they're looking a certain way, what they're really doing is the eyes are coming along with the nose. So any scene is entirely transformed if your first perception of it is, is your nose. The dog's nose is much more sensitive than ours. And they have more genes for these little olfactory receptors that catch the odor molecules. They have more of the, the actual receptors in their nose. They have more surface area in their nose. Their anatomy is such that when air comes in, it gets divided, so some of that goes to the area that is focused on smelling as opposed to breathing. When they breathe out, the air goes out the sides and that helps stir up more odor. So this whole system is really designed to facilitate odor detection. The puppy will not see where she goes. The puppy will have to use his nose to find her. So she's going to enter that rubble, little tiny rubble pile and go into that blue barrel and then the door will get shut. So now the puppy has to be able to locate the person that he can't see. Then he'll give barks and that tells the handler that he has found somebody. If we were out and we wanted to get from, from here to there, we would look and we would say, okay, there's a path there, there's an obstacle there, I can um, make my way around there. And the dog's doing the same thing but using smells. So it's like, I've got this odor that I'm looking for. Oh, that odor, I've got, uh, nope, it's not you. I'm, I, that, I got another odor there, but it's not the odor I'm looking for. And eventually they 
hone in and they can pick out that very small odor among the whole background. Smells are really telling time for dogs. They can imagine what happened in the past by seeing the difference in the concentration of odor. Something that's a very weak odor is something that's diffused over time, and so it's something that happened long ago. Tracking dogs do these fantastic things like detect the difference in concentration of odor between the first and fifth footstep of, of somebody walking along a dirt path. In other words, in what the person has left on the sole of their shoe or in the amount of dirt that's been displaced by that step, there's a different smell over five footsteps for the dog. I think that the dog's nose is particularly special, not just because the nose itself, but because it's connected to the brain, which is connected to the dog, which is connected to the human. So even though there are other species that may have more sensitive sense of smell, they don't really care about telling us about it. The dog is willing to work with us, and so we can actually harness their sense of smell for things that are beneficial to us. The relationship is such a critical component of it. Hey, what's go to work? Come on, go to work. Come on, go to work. Come on, hey, find the bottle. When he starts finding it, and you know he starts finding something, and he sits down. It's um, a little scary because of what he's trained to find, but it's also um, gratifying that he found something that we've trained for so long that he's able to do his job now, that I'm able to help him do his job. So when he finds something, it's a big party. Good boy, good boy, good boy. With having your canine partner, he is everything. If I'm having a bad day, he's having a bad day. If he's having a bad day, I'm having a bad day. Um, we're one. The bond we have together, it's just something special. He has your back, I have his back. It's just it's very hard to explain, it really is. But you, you know when he's fine, you know when he's working, you know when he's on something. And that's, that's what it's all about. People who live with dogs know that their animals have feelings and emotions. And to that, I would agree. However, just kind of having a feeling that my dog loves me does not cut it as scientific evidence. How else can you figure this out, except through brain imaging? Nobody thought this would work. Most of my colleagues thought that it was an incredibly stupid idea. Because doing functional MRIs in humans is difficult. You have to hold absolutely still. And by still, I mean no movement, say more than a millimeter at a time. And humans have a hard time doing this, so Nobody really thought you could do this with dogs. We'll just see how he does. In order to do anything interesting and, and scientifically valid, the dogs have to be completely awake. They have to be in a state that's not stressful to them. And really the only way that, that, that we saw doing that was to give them the right to not be in the experiment if they don't want to be. But realize that nobody else does this. Um, all other animal studies in imaging environments, the animals 
usually immobilized or sedated in some way. And because we were asking people in the community to volunteer their pets and participate in this project, we want to make sure that we treat the dogs as well as any human. And so set out in our protocol that the dogs would be afforded rights that are not normally given to animals in research. We had to construct a simulator of the whole thing to train the dogs. This is, this is our simulator here, which is basically just a big tube um, constructed at the same, same diameter as the MRI bore and it's got a platform that simulates the patient table. The other part was figuring out how to teach them to hold their head still. And this actually took a lot of trial and error. In the end, we found that boogie board foam seemed to work the best. The other big sticking point is the noise. The MRIs make a lot of noise. They're about 95 decibels, um, and it sounds kind of like a jackhammer. What we ended up doing was finding some earmuffs that are designed for dogs, and we had to figure out a way to kind of wrap it with this kind of gauze to at least just hold it in place. Once we did that, then things went fairly quickly. Just kind of lengthened the amount of time that they had to hold still before they got a treat. And then we simply just added more and more elements. The idea with the brain imaging part of the dog project is when we focus on parts of the brain that we understand well, namely the reward system, to see what things activated their reward system, whether it was just food or whether we could actually show evidence that it was something more than food, what we would call a social reward. What we're finding is that the reward system is maximally activated by the human that the dog knows the best. By looking at structures that are common in dogs as well as humans, under similar conditions where we know that people report positive feelings and positive emotions. If we see similar activity in the dog's brains to similar things, to me, it's a pretty straightforward leap to say, well, gee, dogs are probably experiencing something very similar to what we humans do. That actually looks pretty good, but I, I want to do one more like that. And this is not an original idea. Charles Darwin said this 150 years ago. He said that human emotions had to have evolved from kind of more basic animal emotions. That human emotions just didn't kind of spring out of nowhere. What a good boy. What a champ. Yeah. So this is his structural image, and it's beautiful. Uh, perfectly clear. It's as good as a clinical scan if you had to have that. Um, so what we're going to focus on is this gives us our, our target for this experiment right there, mm -hmm. you can see that. That's the caudate nucleus. That's uh, what we know in other animals to be the heart of the reward system. And we know from other studies that, that this structure responds not just to getting things like food, but signals that predict the food. No one had ever done this before, not an awake dog. And so just seeing it the first time, you know, it's like kind of discovering something that, that nobody else had seen. What I see when I look at dog brands now is how similar they are to human brands. If you kind of set aside the size differences and the differences in, in the frontal lobes, and you look at kind of the core parts, the, the parts that we know the most about, which have to do with emotions, the dogs have all the same hardware that we have. When we look at the brain imaging data and we see evidence of what I would call positive emotions, to me that says that, hey, you know, dogs and probably all the other animals that, that we interact with have kind of this capacity for joy and pleasure in many ways that is the same as ours. And so you realize that there's much more in common than different. Good boy. Up, up, up. Up you go. Okay, great. Would you like a bite? Can you take a bite? Take a bite. Fransky and I were spending a lot of time together, and I thought it would be kind of fun to have a task to do together. And I knew she would be a fabulous therapy dog. We're going to go to the local nursing home where we go every week on Tuesday mornings. 
I think most of us tend to avoid places that have people who are ill and particularly people who are old and ill. Stay there. And I was certainly one of those people. Good girl. The first day at the nursing home was pretty terrifying. I didn't know what to expect. I found myself relying on her. Hello. On her instincts, on her goodness, on her absolute ability to look at people, take them for who they were, not question them in any way, just be in their lives. What's doing? There's a kind of courage that I think I've gotten from her, just from watching her. Francis a bridge, I think. How are you today? Oh you wanna say hi to the doggy? With her, there's always something to talk about. She's a little like goofy, you know, things happen. Um, there's an element of risk. Um, there's always an element of fun. Okay, come here, Pranny. We're not gonna go in there today. No, Audrey's sleeping. A nursing home, like a lot of medical settings, is very routinized. And, um, and that's one of the great things about having animals come in. It, an animal in a nursing home just breaks it all up. Say, I love you. You can do it. Pranny. Oh. Oh, okay. Developing relationships with the people who live there, with the people who work there, was really a reminder that we share this common bond, we share this humanity, we share this life, and that we're all capable of um, reaching out to each other. And I would not have been doing this. I would not have gone there if it weren't for Kransky. At this age, they can't control their body temperature, and so they can't keep themselves warm. So you have to have them right up against you, a nice, nice tight feel so that your body warmth carries over to them. Oh, now he, did, from that, he just started to relax. I was in the Marine Corps for four years. Um, when I got out, I went through a rough time. And that's when I was in, uh, that's when I was admitted into Menlo Park. And just, I took in every aspect of that program. And one of the aspects that helped me the most was uh, with the Pause for Purple Hearts program. It actually helped me calm my nerves and my emotions. Um, I can be, I can have the worst day of my life right now and just to have this little guy on my hands, looking at him, watching him, just petting him, um, it makes everything go away. Have your puppy sit. Sit. Yes. Pause for Purple Hearts is specifically bringing dogs in connection with veterans with PTSD and, and have the dogs help ameliorate those symptoms and they do a fantastic job. At the university, there are veterans who have done both the early puppy training and training older dogs. And one of them just said, about the early puppy training. I feel so empowered. And so now we call it our puppy empowerment program. Beautiful. Come by. I think part of what's so special about our relationship with dogs is that it is deeper than words. But the best I can do in words is that it's this partnership that's both like being in a partnership with a person, but also that is, is a bridge to the natural world. Dogs allow us to be special but not alone. And so when I work with Willie, it's like plugging into this primal bond that has all the social attractiveness of being a great friend with, with a person, but it's also deep in, in a way that words just can't express. Good boy, Willie, Willie. I really think the bond between us and dogs is a biological miracle. Good boy. It's a biological phenomena, and I can tell you that some of the happiest I've ever been in my life is working sheep with Willie.
When we first developed a relationship with dogs, it was this very tit-for-tat relationship. We do something for them, they do something for us. So we both owed each other something. If you're gonna help me hunt, I'm gonna give you some food. If I'm gonna give you some protection, you're gonna guard my campsite. And over thousands of years, dogs have played very important roles, not just in the early days as hunters and herders, but dogs do so much for us that we really do owe them something. We owe them not just food and veterinary care, but we owe them potentially the idea of seeing them as fellow members of society. Citizenship is a very slippery term. What do we mean when we say citizen? Some people say, well, you can only be a citizen if you're a human being, or potentially if you're an adult, or you can vote, or you can fight for your country. But we're seeing dogs fight for their country. We have dogs in the military fighting on the front lines, getting killed, getting injured, coming down with PTSD. Since 2000, dogs can legally inherit money. A divorcing couple will fight over a dog, and the judge will say, well, what's in the best interest of the dog? Which home would the dog be happiest? And you would never say that for any other type of piece of property, like a couch or a toaster. In the eyes of the law, these animals have blurred that line. They really challenge our conceptions about what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a citizen? We can start to see a lot of that through the eyes of dogs. When you think about the, this sort of biological miracle that dogs are, I think that it just helps remind us always that we're not alone and you know, that there are other beings on the planet that um, you know, also are trying to make a living and that actually interacting with another organism that cares about us, that understands us maybe in a different way than we understand ourselves. I like you. That can remind us in our weakest moments of you know, what, what it can be to be happy and what joy can be. I think dogs make us better humans. I think their capacity for love and for connection is just so direct. I think the dogs often allow us to be our most, our best and our most basic and our least sort of compromised selves um, because that's who they are. In some respects, dogs bring out the best in us, it's true. And I suspect the reason why they do so is because they display some of the sort of virtues that we uphold as being good in fellow humans. So the, the loyalty, the fidelity, these types of things that people tend to focus on in, on dogs are, are things we admire in others and uh, feel that we should also show ourselves. So they're kind of presenting us with a mirror and we're looking in that mirror and maybe seeing how we ought to be. It makes me feel optimistic about people that we can have this relationship with dogs. In other words, that we can extend outside of ourselves enough to remember that we are animals, and here's an animal who has an entirely different sensorium, and yet has worked to fit in with us, and we have in some ways worked to fit with them. I think it's a representation of how we're animal and we're attached to other animals. You know, it's sometimes interesting to think of the dog as a kind of ambassador who straddles that boundary between the human world and the, the animal world. And you know, in our culture, the dog has come pretty much over that boundary and joined us on our side. Although there's still a connection there. It's, if you like, it's a creature at the threshold. It's <laughs> there on the doorstep. I think what our relationship with dogs has shown over the millennia is that our destinies are intertwined. We might not be here if it wasn't for dogs. So we owe dogs so much going back to the very beginning.